So today we're going to cover a topic called conjugates and rationalizing the denominator. <clears throat> um, so the reason we have to rationalize the denominator, we're just reminding ourselves of the rules of simplifying square roots. So rule number one, we can't have any perfect square factors under a square root. So that's why something like the square root of 16 isn't simplified because we could evaluate that to 4. Or why the square root of 12 isn't simplified because it has a perfect square factor that we could have pulled out or broken down or simplified to get to root 3. We can't have any fractions under a square root. So for example, if I had 16 over 9 under a fraction, that wouldn't be simplified because I would be able to take the square root of the top and the square root of the bottom and get 4 over 3. And then for example, if I had something like the square root of 16 over 5, I would be able to break that down into the square root of 16 on top and the square root of 5 on the bottom which would be 4 over the square root of 5. But that motivates our last rule. We can't have any square roots in the denominator of a fraction. So something like 4 root 5, or even something like a little more complex, these are not simplified because they have a square root in the denominator. So this is what we're going to be focusing on today. How do we fix this rule? So a little background information, um, but what we're going to do today, if there is a radical in the denominator of a fraction, what we're going to do is a process called rationalizing the denominator. So I've defined what rationalizing the denominator is. It's just a process for rewriting expressions that have radicals in the denominator. And the thing I want to talk about real fast is why is it called that? Um, so in math, we have a lot of different types of numbers. Um, some of them you already know would be like the whole numbers, numbers like 1 and 2, 3, 4, 5, no decimals or anything. You might have heard of the integers, which are the positive and the negative whole numbers. There's a number, uh, a type of numbers in math called rational numbers. Now what rational numbers are, there's two ways we can think about it. A rational number is any number that can be expressed as a fraction. So like 3 halves is rational. The number 6 is rational because I could write that as a fraction of 6 over 1. Even some decimals are, fra are rational numbers, like 0 0.5. That's the fraction 1 half. Some decimals go on forever, like the number 1 third is rational, even though its decimal goes on forever, because the decimal that goes on forever follows a pattern. So we want to recognize or understand that rational numbers are numbers that can be expressed as a fraction, or if we see them as decimals, they're decimals that either end or go on forever with a pattern. So if there's a rational number, then there is what we call an irrational number. Now an irrational number are numbers that cannot be expressed as a fraction. If they're decimals, they're decimals that go on forever or they don't have a pattern or forever without a pattern, excuse me. So for example, something like pi is an irrational number because we know 3.14159, that's just gonna keep going forever and ever and there's no pattern to it. Same thing with like the square root of two. If I try to type it into my calculator, I would just get a bunch of decimals that don't follow a pattern. So it brings up an, kind of like something that we usually see when we write rational numbers, because their decimals go on forever without a pattern, we usually use symbols to represent these numbers. So just putting everything together, the reason why we call it rationalizing the denominator is we start with a number in the denominator that is irrational. And through some process, which we'll learn soon, we're going to rewrite that number that doesn't have a square root in the denominator. So the denominator was a rash, irrational number. But then through a process, we were able to change it to a rational number. That's why we call it rationalizing the denominator. There are two main types of rationalizing denominator problems that you're going to have to do. So the first type of problem that you're going to see is when there's only one term in the denominator. And of course, that one term has to have a radical. Otherwise, we wouldn't need to rationalize it. So this term here has a square root in the denominator, which is not allowed. So I have a list of steps over here that you can write down and follow. But whenever we do that, whenever we have um, just one single square root in the denominator, we're going to multiply the numerator and the denominator by whatever radical is in the denominator. So since this um, denominator has a square root of 5, I'm going to multiply the bottom by the square root of 5 and the top by the square root of 5. So on top, 3 times root 5 
is just 3 root 5. And on the bottom, root 5 times root 5 is just a 5. And we are done. Now it's important to see that this is just a form of 1. And we know when we take any number, like 3, and we multiply it by 1, we don't change the value. Even if I took 1 half and multiplied it by 1, I still get 1 half. Now 1 can look different, but it's still being multiplied by 1. So for example, if I took 1 half and multiplied it by 10 over 10, this is just a weird way of writing the number 1. This would be 10 over 20 which is still equal to a half, it just looks different. So what's important for us to see when we're rationalizing the denominator, all we're really doing is multiplying by a form of one. And we know that multiplying by, and I'm putting in the quotation marks, one, because maybe I write it as a one, or maybe I make it look like root five over root five. But multiplying by one doesn't change the value. It might change the way it looks, but it's still the same value. So here's an, another example for us. Um, we can see that this is still type one because there's only one term in the denominator. Now, when we have one term in the denominator, we still follow the same rules. We need to multiply the numerator and the denominator by whatever the radical was in the denominator. So here, the only radical is root three. I don't really need to worry about the two. I can just multiply by whatever the radical was. So if we finish our multiplication, five times root three is five root three. And on the bottom, two square roots of three times the square root of three. Well, we know that's going to be two times three, which would be six. We have five square root of three over six. So here we see another example where we have one term in the denominator. And that term in the denominator is the square root of 18. Um, so whenever we have one term in the denominator, we are always following this same rule. We're going to multiply the numerator and the denominator by whatever the square root in the original denominator was. So I need to multiply the top and the bottom by the square root of 18. Now this example brings up an important part. We're gonna to need to use the distributive property on top. The square root of 18 needs to be multiplied by everything on top. So the square root of 18 times square root of five, that's the square root of 90. And then the square root of two times the square root of 18, well two times 18 is 36. And then on the bottom, root 18 times root 18 is 18. Now the reason we bring this example up is because just like we know before, whenever we have a, um, an answer, we need to simplify the answer as much as possible. So I can see some of the radicals, like the square root of 90, needs to be simplified into root 9 times root 10. And the square root of 36 is just 6, and on the bottom I have 18. So if I simplify that one more, I get 3 root 10 plus 6 over 18. Now that answer is not quite simplified yet. There's one more part to our answer, which is what I have highlighted down here for us. Um, when we simplify fractions that have multiple terms, either in the numerator or the denominator, we can only reduce the terms if all of them are divisible by a certain number. Um, so for instance, when I look at my problem, I see a three as a coefficient. I see a six as a coefficient and I see an 18 as a coefficient. So I can only reduce that by a number that goes into all of those. So a common factor for three, six, and 18, they are all divisible by three. So I'd be able to reduce all of them by a factor of three. Or if we don't wanna write the one, we could just say that's the square root of 10 plus two over six. And that is my final answer. I want you to see again what we're saying is I can't reduce the 2 and the 6 because that's only two of the terms. If I want to reduce all the terms by 2, I would have to reduce this 1 by a 2 as well. So the numbers 1, 2, and 6 do not have a common factor, so I cannot simplify that anymore. That's just going to be my final answer. Just leave the square root of 10 plus 2 over 6.
Now, the second type of problem that you're going to see when you're rationalizing denominators is when there's two terms in the denominator. Now, when there's two terms, like I have down here and here, I could either have just one square root in the denominator, or I could have two separate square roots. doesn't really matter as long as there's two terms in the denominator and there's at least one radical. So I do have a list of steps that we will come back to. Um, but what it says here is when we have a problem like this, we need to multiply the top and the bottom by something called the conjugate. Um, and we're going to look at that on the next slide here. So conjugates are binomials in a certain form. And I have that general form written here. What I want you to see is they have the same terms, ax and ax, so I can like highlight that's the same term in both parentheses. They also have a b in both parentheses, but one of them is separated by a minus sign and one of them is separated by a plus sign. So for example, these right here are conjugates. One of them is an x and a minus three, one of them is an x plus 3. So quickly, let's investigate what happens when we multiply them. So x times x would be x squared. Then we get positive 3x. Then we get negative 3x. And negative 3 times 3 is negative 9. So we can see that these terms actually cancel. We get x squared minus 9. Over here, again, we have examples of conjugates because I can see 2x and 5 in both. Right? There's a 2x here in the first term and a 2x in the second term. There's a 5 and a 5. The only difference is one of them is a minus and one of them is a plus. So they're conjugates. So if we multiply, 2x times 2x is 4x squared. 2x times 5 is positive 10x. Negative 5 times 2x is negative 10x. And at the end, negative 5 times 5 is negative 25. So we do see that these cancel as well. And we're left with 4x squared minus 25 which allows us to summarize what I have down here. When we're multiplying conjugates, there's always some cancellation of terms. Here, the 3x and the negative 3x canceled. Here, the 10x and the negative 10x canceled. Not only that, but when we're done multiplying conjugates, the terms are always perfect squares. I know the square root of x squared, it's just x, and I know the square root of 9, just like with this one. I know the square root of 4x squared, and I would know the square root of 25. So we're going to use that idea to help us cancel or reduce or get rid of square roots. So let's complete this example. This is one that I used to introduce type 2. But what we can see here is there's two terms in the denominator. So we identify that first. And if there's two terms, then we know that we have to use this list of steps. What we need to do is multiply the numerator and the denominator by the conjugate. So for the conjugate, I keep the terms. So a 3 and the square root of 2. But rather than being separated with a minus sign like they are here, I would connect them with a plus sign. And as we know before, if I do something to the bottom of a fraction, I have to do it to the top of a fraction. So I'll distribute. So 1 times 3 is equal to 3. 1 times root 2 is the square root of 2. Now on the bottom, we should see some canceling. I'll do that in blue. So I'll use my FOIL method. 3 times 3 is 9. 3 times root 2 is positive 3 root 2. 3 times negative root 2 is negative 3 root 2. And on the bottom, negative 2, or excuse me, negative root 2 times positive root 2 would be negative 2, because root 2 times root 2 is just 2. So we do see some canceling on the bottom. So rewriting our answer, on top we have 3 plus the square root of 2. On the bottom, we'd just be left with 9 minus 2. And we can simplify that into the number 7. So again, what we should notice is we started the problem that had a square root in the denominator. So we needed to get rid of the irrational number by rationalizing it. What we did was we multiplied by the conjugate, and at the end, we no longer have a square root in the denominator. So here's another example, and when we look at it, we see some square roots in the denominator, which are not allowed. What I notice right away is that there's two terms in the denominator. So if there's two terms in the denominator, we have to multiply by the conjugate. So first I'll set it up, I'm gonna write in blue to begin with. So on the bottom, if I'm gonna multiply by the conjugate, I keep the first term, which was five square roots of two. I change the minus to a plus, or a plus to a minus, and then I would keep the last term. And if I do it on the bottom, I have to do it on the top. So I'm gonna write five square roots of two plus three square roots of seven. And now we just distribute. So I'm gonna write below here. So on top, I get three times five root two, which is 15 roots 2, and then three groups of 3 root 7 would be 9 root 7. Now on the bottom, which I'll do in green here, 
5 root 2 times 5 root 2. Well, 5 times 5 gives us 25, and root 2 times root 2 is just 2. 5 root 2 times 3 root 7, so 5 times 3 would give us 15. Root 2 times root 7 would give us root 14. Moving on to the inside terms, negative 3 root 7 times 5 root 2. Well, negative 3 and 5 would give negative 15. Root 7 and root 2 would make a root 14. Finally, at the end, I have negative 3 root 7 times positive 3 root 7. So negative 3 times positive 3 will give us a negative 9. The square root of 7 times the square root of 7, by definition, is just 7. So we'll do some simplification. On top, I have 15 square roots of 2 plus 9 square roots of 7. On the bottom, 25 times 2, that's 50. These will cancel. Negative 9 times 7 is negative 63. So on top, 15 root 2 plus 9 root 7. And on the bottom, 50 minus 63 is negative 13. This is going to be my final answer. And what we can see is the square root of 2 doesn't simplify. The square root of 9 doesn't simplify. And there's no number that goes into 15, 9, and 13. So we have another example of rationalizing the denominator. And as always, we should look to see that there are two terms in the denominator. So if there's two terms in the denominator, we always have to multiply by the conjugate. So the conjugate of the denominator, I keep the first number and change this sign to the opposite. So instead of a plus, I would change that to a minus, and I would keep the last term. If I do it to the bottom, I need to do it to the top. So we'll use our multiplication property. Now on top, I like to put it in my parentheses so it helps me with my FOIL method. So 3 root 2 times negative 6, that would be negative 18 root 2. 3 root 2 times negative root 3 gives us 3, sorry, excuse me, negative 3, because 3 times negative 1. So we have negative 3 square roots of 6. Move on to the next term. 5 times negative 6 is negative 30. And then 5 times negative root 3 is negative 5 square roots of 3. We'll work on our denominator, which I will do in green. So the first term is negative 6 times 6. That's positive 36. Negative 6 times negative root 3 is a positive 6 root 3. Root 3 times negative 6 is negative 3 root 3. And at the end, root 3 times root 3. Um, so po positive root 3 times negative root 3 should be a negative, And root 3 times root 3 is just 3. So now we can simplify. So on top, I notice that there are no like terms. So I'm just going to rewrite the top. Negative 18 root 2 minus 3 root 6 minus 30 minus 5 root 3. Now on the bottom, though, there is some simplification. So we have the 36, but 6 root 3 and negative 6 root 3 cancel. So we just have minus 3 left. So on top, we have negative 18 root 2 minus 3 root 6 minus 30 minus 5 root 3. And the denominator, we would just have the number 33. Now just to make sure I'm done, I always check. There are no perfect square factors that I could rewrite any of those radicals. There are no fractions under a radical. The denominator doesn't have a radical. And I don't think there's a number that goes into negative 18, 3, negative 30, negative 5, and 33 all at once. So this would be my final answer.